Hello, everyone. I am Danny Zwischenberger with the Kentucky Horticulture Council, and I'd like to welcome you to another Tech Tuesday. If you are new to Tech Tuesday, this is a series of educational tools meant to support high tunnel and greenhouse producers across the state and any growers interested in season extension in general. Um, today, we are doing a deep dive into all things insurance and kind of where greenhouses and high tunnels fall into that in terms of coverage options. And we are covering a lot of information today, and I'm very excited for the lineup of speakers here who will be sharing their experiences and their expertise on a topic that can sometimes be challenging to navigate for a lot of folks. So I am grateful that y'all are here and thank you to everyone else who is able to join us this afternoon. We are recording this meeting so that anybody can go back and have a listen if they weren't able to join us. And you'll be able to find this video and all of our past Tech Tuesday content on the Hort Council's website and social media pages if you'd like to get caught up. And I will definitely be sending out a follow-up email with those details after today's webinar, as well as further resources that get mentioned throughout the conversation. So just a couple of logistical notes before we get started today. This is a disclaimer that throughout our Tech Tuesday series, we do showcase a wide variety of tech companies, brands, and products, but the Kentucky Horticulture Council does not necessarily endorse um, any one of them specifically. The focus of this series is to educate and empower growers and growers should make purchasing decisions based on the needs of their own operations. And lastly, if you have any questions for our speakers during this presentation, feel free to drop those questions in the chat. Or if you'd prefer, there will be an opportunity after the presentations to ask aloud during a Q&A. So we will go ahead and jump into today's episode, and I'll kind of let each of our speakers introduce themselves in a little more depth before their individual presentations. But just as a quick overview, um, joining us is Casey Bird, a University of Kentucky Extension Associate in Greenhouse and Controlled Environments. And Casey was kind of the impetus for today's webinar topic as she's been working with Kentucky growers throughout the eastern part of our state in support of controlled environment operations operations and protected ag spaces. Um, we'll have Spencer Gwynn. He's a business development specialist at the Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development, or KCARD, which we'll hear more about. Um, we partner with them on the regular basis. And Spencer and his team work directly with growers to assist them with any number of challenges from marketing to organization to financial planning and beyond. Also on the call is Nathan Howell of Needmore Acres in Western Kentucky, and also Victoria McFarland and Josh Abbott from Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance. So it's a stacked lineup today. Um, I'm really grateful y'all are here. And with that, I will turn it over to Casey. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. And um, for those of you viewing, thanks for viewing. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. I've got just a few slides. All right. Um, so as Danny mentioned, I do work with growers primarily in Eastern Kentucky. Um, I work with K through 12 educators, FFA. Um, and most recently I've been working with prisons and detention center, Hort education. Um, and one thing that we found even just yesterday, I was in Casey County and spoke to a, a grower and he said, you know, I, I didn't realize that greenhouses could be insured or I thought it was relatively hard. And I said, you know, that is true, you know, even still in some ways, but um, there are ways that you can cover your investment. And um, we're actually doing this greenhouse series um, on it. And uh for those of you that are attending the 2025 uh, Fruit and Vegetable Conference in Lexington, Kentucky, I will be presenting, um, you know, a short version of this and have some printed uh, handouts for those. So if you'll be there, come by, say hi, and um, let's get started. So um, Kentucky's changing climate, um, you know, as as the, the climate is changing nationally here in Kentucky. We've seen that, especially most recently um, with Hurricane Helene and all those rains. And we're seeing more hail, more 
tornadoes, these um, massive storms that used to only happen once every hundred years are happening more frequently and more intensely. And then, of course, you've got periods of drought um, in times of years that we didn't primarily have drought. So there's a lot going on. And uh, Kentucky is, you know, still prone to a lot of things. Uh, as the slide mentions, part of Western Kentucky is considered to be uh, in Tornado Alley now due to some of the changing climates and uh, things like that. So definitely something to consider when you're thinking about your investment. Um, greenhouses, high tunnels, um, agriculture in general is not cheap to do um, on any scale. There's still going to be costs and equipment and, um, you know, Not everyone has enough money to just go and buy a new high tunnel when some high winds come and totally destroy it or throw it in the river. Um, so we're going to be looking at types of coverage today, and I'm not an insurance um, agent. I'm not a professional in that. I have insurance for my farm, so I'm coming from it as a, as a client. But uh, we've got general and professional liability insurance, structural equipment, um, And these are all things that you should talk to your agent about. Um, every policy is unique. Every policy is different. And every agent or company operates differently. So it's also important to talk to different companies when you're looking for a policy and see which one's best going to suit your needs. So professional liability insurance, um, if you're agritourism on top of producing things in, in a greenhouse, Um, you're going to have to consider the people that are coming onto your farm. Are they, you know, considered to be insured? Uh, what are you required to insure for your business? Um, so make sure you, you check everything off. Um, uh, my insurance agent always says, you know, being overly insured is never a bad thing. And, um, the more that I read in the news about, you know, people getting injured somewhere and suing and the amount of payouts that are happening, I tend to agree um, with, with them more. Um, and again, this is something that you need to talk to your agent about. Um, look for your liability points. Uh, do you have volunteers that come onto your farm? Are they needing to be insured as contractors? Or do you need to have them sign a liability wager, uh, waiver? And what does a liability waiver look like? Um, these are all things that should be considered. And of course, your structural insurance. Never, ever, ever assume that something is covered. Um, if if you have a question, call somebody that's a professional and ask, is this covered? How can I get this covered? And sometimes your, your insurance agent may know a roundabout way, like, okay, we may not offer greenhouse coverage as it is, but there's a policy that we can open it up and work it so it still covers your greenhouse. Um, I recently purchased a tractor and I called my uh, insurance agent. I said, hey, do I need to get this insured through auto insurance or, you know, is this covered in my home policy? And um, he said, you know, we don't do tractor insurance and, you know, your auto insurance, they don't do tractor insurance. So I, um, I got a farm policy opened up and I put that, um, that tractor on that policy and it's only for me just, you know, a few extra bucks a month, but, um, I feel a lot better knowing that if a flood came and damaged the engine or if a tree fell on it and cracked something on it, um, it would be covered. Uh, and that's peace of mind. Natural disasters, um, as you know, as I said, you never know when it's going to strike, how bad it's going to be. Um, even, you know, whether, you know, meteorologists, weather professionals, they can say, oh, the, there's going to be a flood, but we only think it's going to be a few inches. Well, mother nature will say, watch this and go a few feet. <laughs> so it's important to look at your geography. How close are you to bodies of water that could flood? Um, Are you in an area where there's been tornadoes in the past 10, 20 years? Um, so I, I personally walked around my house and I did just a really kind of cynical view of, okay, what could happen here? Worst case scenario. And I called my insurance agent. I said, Hey, there's a lot of like standing dead trees 
is there any coverage for me to preemptively get these removed before they damage my house? And they were like, no, unfortunately not. So um, I'm trying to find ways to protect my investment um, in ways where my insurance doesn't quite do that preventative coverage. Um, so definitely walk around and, and look at what needs repaired, what, what could be damaged, take notes. And um, I recommend scheduling a meeting, you know, even just a phone call or a drop in um, with your, your insurance agent and just kind of give them an update on what you've invested in recently, um, things you're noticing that are different. And they may also have some community resources to help you get grants or whatnot to do some of that preemptive stuff. Um, and then here's uh, the, the seismic or the, yeah, these are the uh, tornadoes. Uh, as you can tell there in Western Kentucky, there's lots of red there. Um, so climate's changing, natural disasters happening. And uh, yeah, gap insurance for your equipment. Uh, if, if you have a, a lender that has a lien on that, um, or even on your property, you may have different type of lien holders. Um, gap insurance is super important. And I learned that the hard way, um, through a car accident, um, that goes for, you know, any type of equipment, um, uh, make sure that you cover yourself. Um, so you don't have to drain your savings or go into debt or bankruptcy or lose everything you've worked for. Um, when there's services out there that can help protect you, uh, crop insurance, this, uh, this is not really my field of expertise, but I did want to provide this crop insurance history for the state of Kentucky. Um, you know, as you can see, those numbers are steadily going up of what's being insured and the liabilities. You know, things are getting more expensive. Um, it's now is definitely the time to start thinking about crop history or sorry, crop insurance. And Spencer will talk a little bit about that and give you some resources um, so I'm not going to go into that too much. Uh, NAP, again, that's USDA. Um, so definitely know your deadline and you have to submit reports. If you do not submit those reports, you're not going to be covered. So always make sure you put calendar reminders in your phone, whatever you can do to make sure that you submit on time. Um, and if you have a uh, workforce, you know, how are you covering them? Do you need to provide um, any workers' comp coverage for your um, your contractors? Uh, do you have an H-2A labor force, you know, the people that organize that for you? What do they cover? What do they require for you to cover? Um, has that changed since you first, you know, touch base with them? Um, so don't overlook the workers in terms of insurance either, because um, that is important and can be a huge liability for you. And then I created this checklist, and if you're going to Fruit and Veg um, Conference, I will have some of these printed out, but you should be able to access this, and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but this is just an annual checklist, kind of something for you to print off. Um, I laminated mine, and just especially kind of this time of the year where you're, um, you're growing, slowing down a little bit, and you're uh, gearing up for the holidays, you're kind of winterizing your equipment and getting everything ready for winter. This is a good time to do that. Um, and just go through, check your structures, your crops, your equipment, and uh, any other things that you've invested in. Make sure you've got photos, receipts stored, and checking with your agent to see how they, like what they would need in terms of hey, if this got damaged and I needed to file a claim on it, what would you need um, to, to make this happen? And they will definitely tell you. And uh, I always keep a hard copy of things and a virtual copy. Um, so thanks so much for uh, listening. And I believe we have Spencer next. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Casey. Awesome. Uh yeah, so um, Spencer here is with KCARD, um, great organization, and I'm going to turn it over to him, and he's got some good stuff to share. Awesome. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate the introduction and the information there. Um, I would like to turn it over. I've got a colleague of mine, uh, Logan Crawford, uh, business development uh, specialist here within KCARD, 
uh, like myself, and I'd just like to turn it over to him, provide a little bit of history about our organization, and then I'll talk about a few more points related to some of the things that uh, Casey brought up earlier. So, Logan, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate the introduction and glad to be on the call today. That's been a good learning experience so far. Um, I'll just give a, a brief uh, kind of overview of the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, just in case if you have heard of us, you may not know exactly what we do, just to kind of give a little brief synopsis. So KCARD, we're a, a nonprofit organization. Um, we were founded back in, in 2001, and we receive um, different, uh, different grant funds from the Kentucky um, Agricultural Development Board, as well as the USDA through their um, their uh, rural cooperative development grant, then we're able to provide services to farmers and agribusinesses throughout the state of Kentucky, um, typically at no charge to them. And just some of those services, I'll just kind of mention real quick that we provide um, business plan development. Um, we do a lot of work with farmers and ag businesses on if they're starting a new business or expanding an existing business. Oftentimes they need to either create a new business plan or beef up their current business plan. So we offer those services. Um, we've also done some marketing assistance um, with, with different producers throughout the state, um, identifying potential markets for them to sell their products in, social media strategies, different things like that. Um, we've also done financial analysis and financial projections for different organizations. Um, oftentimes when you're uh, expanding or creating a new business, um, it's a good idea to project out income and expenses for a for a certain time period out in the future. So we specialize a lot of we we specialize with helping producers um, estimate their costs and revenue. Um, we also do a lot of work with uh, record keeping assistance, helping farmers understand good record keeping practices, and then also developing tools that will help them keep good records. Um, you know, especially if they're not wanting to use QuickBooks or something like that, we'll try to work with them with different spreadsheets and things. Um, and then we also um, help uh, agribusinesses and farmers locate and apply for uh, funding throughout the state that they may apply for that will help them enhance their business. So uh, we kind of do a lot of different things. And if there's anything that um, if you need help with or have a have a have a client or someone who needs services like that, definitely uh, send them our way and we'll do our best to, to take care of them. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Logan. I think that's uh give everybody a little rundown about what we do here. Uh, I think that's good for everybody to know the services we offer. Uh, one thing that I did want to share uh, before I get into a, a brief talk about things, if I can share my screen, I've got two screens. So if it looks like I'm looking, not looking at the camera, it's just because I'm looking at the other screen that I've got pulled up for, for a couple things. I wanted to share with you all our website. Um, it covers a lot of the information that Logan talked about and then also give some other resources. We try to do um, several blogs that kind of share what's going on with the clients that we talk about or talk with. Um, you know, we visit with 500 plus clients a year, uh, meeting around the kitchen room table and sharing information about what we know and how to help them grow their business or expand it on a different enterprise. So, you know, whenever you see our website here that I've got pulled up and sharing on the screen, you know, you'll see some of those blogs listed there, right there in the center. Uh, we try to refresh those pretty often, uh, keep those up to date one every other week. One a week usually is what we try to average uh, there. If you want, uh, we also have a listserv sign up. We do try to do two listservs uh, within KCARD. One is just general, what's going on in KCARD right now. The second one is a funding matters listserv. So that lets you know what grants are available, what uh, programs might be an opportunity for you to apply for for your farm, whether it's related to hot tunnel production, horticulture in general, uh, really any kind of, of agriculture value added um, production, whatever. Uh, that's something that we can help keep you abreast of what's available to you to, to apply for. And then um, if you scroll through, I'm going to scroll back up here to the top. You know, we try to have some different resources there. Uh, if you see that pull down menu, we've got some for beginning farmers to let you know what agencies might be able to help you, um, as well as ways to start your business or expand your business. And then if you go to the about page, you can see the other members of our staff that are available for you to talk to. 
uh, and then also ways to contact uh, us directly. So that's kind of what KCAR does in a nutshell. Um, Logan mentioned, um, you know, business planning and things of that nature, financial projections. And then Casey also mentioned um, talking a little bit about um, how to keep up with records and things for different crop insurance options that might be available to you. I don't have enough time to get into a lot of that detail now, but I wanted to just throw a few things at you. Um, Kentucky is very fortunate in the fact that we have what's called the Center for Crop Diversification. It's ran out of the University of Kentucky uh, College of Agriculture, um, and they offer a lot of different resources to farmers. Uh, let me back up here one page. So if you type in, do a Google, a Google search for Center for Crop Diversification, this will be their homepage that it brings you to. And a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Uh, one, whenever you're thinking about, if you're thinking about building a high tunnel, uh, there are some grant opportunities available to do that. Uh, we can help kind of point you in the direction of where to talk to, to look at building those structures for your farm. Uh, another thing is, what is this, what value is this going to add to my operation? Uh, we can help you think through some of those things at KCARD. Uh, the first that I would point you to, one of the first things is, is how are we going to pay for that? You know, if we do or don't get a grant, you know, to handle that upfront cost, that's one thing. The other piece of that puzzle is going to be uh, price reports to try and figure out what can I sell to help recoup some of that cost and that operational expense associated with that. So a couple of price reports that are offered here. Uh, this is the main screen. If you click on that price report tab, um, it's going to show you Kentucky farmers market price reports from all across the state from the time those markets open in late spring or excuse me, sometimes early spring, March and April timeframe until they close, which a lot of markets are closing now here in October, early November. So they'll have a price report list from a selection of markets all across the state that you can look up uh, and see what, you know, more direct consumer pricing would be. The other one, if you're thinking of doing things more at a larger scale uh, to try and utilize that high tunnel or controlled environment agriculture in your operation, then Kentucky produce auction price reports would be more for that wholesale account that you might have. And that's going to show you price reports from all across the state. Uh, you know, again, from the time those markets open till they close in a growing season, but that will also show you reports for those across our, our Commonwealth. The only other thing that I wanted to show real quickly, just so that you have an idea of that it's here is budgets. Um, if you come to us and ask for help with putting together financials for your farming operation, um, in addition to the marketing plan to support where, you know, you might sell your things and who your target customers might be, this would be the next piece of that puzzle is, is trying to figure out what it's going to cost to produce in that high tunnel uh, or in open field growing conditions uh, for different crops. You know, what I usually do, I'm a farmer myself in central Kentucky, so I can kind of think of it from the business side. And then I can also think of it from the producer side. Um, and several of us on staff have that skill set and experience as well. So we try to help you think through some common budgets that are available. I usually start right here. If you see this kind of lit up with a, a vegetable production uh, and melon budget, I usually start with a small scale for a high tunnel. And then we add in those costs that might not be incurred because this is based on open field growing conditions. So let's think about how it relates to you and a high tunnel production system. Um, so that's that's kind of the couple things that I wanted to highlight for you uh, today as far as that goes. Um, to circle back with the crop insurance discussion that Casey mentioned, um, that's something that we could sit down, be glad to sit down and talk with you about. We also have a list of crop insurance agents that are available for you to work with across our state. Um, as Danny mentioned early on, we don't endorse or support any one particular agent or entity, but we try to provide a list of people that we have heard good things about. So that's something that we can help direct you with. And then we can also help to try and help you think through record keeping strategies, because whenever you do a crop insurance um, policy, one of the things that you need to keep a track of is um, what your yield is for those crops. So we can help you think of some ways based on what type of production ag you're involved with that can help utilize those systems and policies. Oh, I know we've got a lot to cover today, and I want to be uh, be able to show share with you a couple of folks that um, uh, whenever Casey and Danny ask KCAR to be involved with this and talk about 
insurance within controlled environment ag, you know, I thought, well, let's bring in some producers. Let's find a couple of producers or a producer that maybe has experience uh, in this realm. And then also find some people who may offer insurance uh, policies and packages for some of these structures and the, some of the things that Casey mentioned earlier. So uh, with that, I would like to have the opportunity to introduce Mr. Nathan Howe with Need More Acres. Um, known Nathan for quite a while now and, uh, and thankful that he's willing to, to join us today and share some of his experience with using high tunnels. I've heard it before from, from several people that he grows a mean uh, heirloom tomato in the high tunnels that he uses. So uh, Nathan, I'll turn it over to you and, uh, and thank you for joining us today as well. Yes, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share my experience that uh, we've had here on the farm. We are a uh, small family farm in South Central Kentucky, a four seasons farm actually. And being four seasons, primarily we're using protective ag and greenhouse environments, typically for winter production is what we're looking at. And when I say winter, uh, you know, anywhere from November all the way up to March is our typical use of those environments. Uh, we have eight structures here on farm that we utilize Everything from a true greenhouse structure all the way to a simple caterpillar type tunnel. Now, we do not have all those insured just because of the price point of them. And as someone, as a producer talking to another producer, I would just have them look at the cost of replacing that structure. And if it is feasible for them to actually pay a policy on that, on that particular structure they may have. For example, our caterpillar tunnels are simple um, structures, plastic PVC pipe, typical held down by string and rope, really not worth the premium that I need to pay, you know, to have that covered. Where our uh, true greenhouse structures are your traditional metal framed, you know, a little bit more substantial structure, a lot more cost in replacing that. So we do insure those. Now, when we very first started, we did not insure those just because I uh, took the risk. Uh, we simply just didn't have the money to do it, to be honest with you. And that's something else a producer may may face. Um, but over the past years, uh, as we've grown, we've been able to be have that extra income where we feel that we can pay those premiums and have those insured. Now, my experience that you've asked me to share actually came, uh, I call it the Kentucky Hurricane. I don't know what the official name of that event was, but it was March the 3rd of 23 when we had uh, sustained winds of 20, 30 mile an hour and peaks of around 80, 80 plus here on the farm. Uh, and I will share with you the structures that I had damage on were structures that were single layer plastic. Uh, the double layered uh, with the air blown in insulation layer, uh, I had no damage on those structures. And we had three of those on farm. And of the four that actually got damage, uh, three of those were insured. One was that little poly caterpillar tunnel that we're talking about. And it wound up in my neighbor's treetops. So, uh, but the, the process uh, that you asked me to share the first thing in any situation, it, it, it's almost like any claim, uh, contact your agent, you know, get that initial start going. Uh, I did that by phone call uh, with, and I am insured with Kentucky Farm Bureau. Uh, or you have the option, they have a hotline that you can actually file a claim on, or you can file a claim online uh, through your own uh, personal account with them. Uh, I actually called the agent firsthand, and he actually helped me file the claim. The next step after filing that claim, of course, it goes to a regional office, and I think there's 15 spread out throughout the state of Kentucky. Fortunately, I'm here uh, pretty close to Bowling Green area, and there's a uh, claims office there. But once it goes through claims office, the regional claims office, uh, they'll appoint a, an adjuster that will come out and physically see the damage. Uh, that is, as a producer, that's where I would highly suggest that you be prepared. Uh, you know, we've been talking about records and so forth. Have the records of what that tunnel cost, 
have your policy with you, know what you have on what coverage you actually have on that particular structure itself and have any photos that you've taken. It's hard not to clean up stuff, but if you cannot clean up anything until that adjuster comes out, that's probably better. Uh, I would feel uh, if you do any cleanup, don't dispose of any of the excess plastic or greenhouse materials. Uh, keep them, you know, somewhere on the farm so that adjuster probably can at least see them. Um, and the third, the final, the the thing about I was I was not fortunate of having the damage, but when I had the damage, I was kind of fortunate because that fell under a what Kentucky Farm Bureau classifies as a catastrophic event. So that actually sped up the process for me. Uh, believe it or not, they actually had more folks like boots on ground type situation in that that particular. They had so many claims, uh, they brought in extra help. And from the time I actually called my agent to probably getting a reimbursement or a check in my hand was under two weeks. And I felt that was pretty fast in that situation and understanding how many claims they actually had. Mine was really small to a lot of individuals, you know, that lost homes and so forth. But I, uh, it helped me get that structure back where it needed to be to protect the crops in it. The actual coverage that I have is just, it's under my farm policy. So it would be like if you insured a barn or a tool shed, uh, we have our packing shed under that same section of that policy. And they are considered uh, just private greenhouse structures. Uh, I'm trying to look at my policy here to make sure I tell you right. I do have a um, an endorsement on those of snow, ice, and sleet. And I also have an endorsement of debris removal on there. So it paid for any physical labor that I had to hire or do myself to, to dispose of the plastics and so forth. Now my particular policy, and as uh, was mentioned earlier, all policies are different. So just make sure you know what's on your policy and you've got the coverage that you want. Mine actually just covers frame structure, uh, does not cover any crop underneath, does not cover the actual plastic itself. It covers the frame, uh, the baseboards, heaters, anything uh, hard structure in there. I will say with that though, when I submitted this, uh, the adjuster and uh, agent and the uh, claims office all worked with me and we were able to actually cover some of that plastic in that. So they helped, Kentucky Farm Bureau really helped me and stepped up to the plate and was able to get, get that covered for me also. Uh, I think that's all I have actually to share. Hopefully I have some good questions. I'm a more of a question answer kind of guy, but hopefully that helped out a little bit. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. I, I think that was good. It, and it, it gives, we, we wanted to try and provide folks listening or, or maybe watching later on uh, an idea of, you know, firsthand experience. I think that was great. Uh, so appreciate you doing that today and being willing to, to talk openly about it. Um, you know, as I mentioned, whenever Casey and Danny ask us to be a part of this, the other thing that I thought about was, well, let's see if we can find some folks who who live and breathe insurance and can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the policy side of things and inducing to what the producers experience, you know, in getting the insurance and then dealing with the claim and the unfortunate event that something does happen. So um, reached out to a couple of contacts and Thankful that uh, Victoria McFarland and Mr. Josh Abbott were able to join us today from Kentucky Farm Bureau. Um, Josh, I understand you're a claims director, and Ms. Victoria, I think you're a commercial field underwriter for a southern part of Kentucky. So thank you all for joining us today to, to talk the insurance world and, and kind of help give folks an idea of what and how they can protect these things if they decide to implement them. So with that, I'll turn it over to you all, and uh, and and thank you all again. Thanks, Spencer, and we're grateful to be a part of here and be invited. Um, Nathan, it was nice to hear your perspective on how you got your claim handled, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate listening to that. Um, I'm a field underwriter for the southeastern part of the state, Spencer had mentioned that, and I work alongside with agents at the front end of the policy when they're writing it, and so 
I see um, a few things that, you know, we might want to take care of working with the agents. And Casey did a fantastic job on highlighting a lot of things with insurance and what all you want to look for. But I definitely want to add some um, tips on my side. Um, I wrote my notes here and I've been writing notes all along so I can <laughs> keep up with everything. But um, definitely want to reiterate what Casey said and keep your agent informed. Keep that open communication. If you add buildings, if you subtract buildings, if you add activities, definitely want to let them know um, any changes that you do have on your farm. So that way we can they can make sure that you're being taken care of in terms of what changes are happening. Um, also, with farms you see, you know, going to events or hosting events, you definitely want to ask for any insurance requirements that you may have um, and talk with your agent over insurance requirements or certificates that you may need or they may need or liability limits and discuss liability limits that you may have for insurance requirements. Um, definitely make sure that your liability limits are in tune with what you have. Um, Nathan, you did a great job at mentioning that and just saying, you know, this is the buildings that you have. You want to make sure that they're insured if you're able to do it. If not, you want to make sure that you have the liability coverage for them if it's needed. Um, and my biggest thing that I hope I can say is just make sure you definitely communicate with your agent and let them know what's going on. Um, you want to make sure that if you do have any changes or if you're thinking about any changes or adding or subtracting that you're you're discussing with them and at least pricing it or knowing a little bit more insight with it. Um, it's hard to know everything about everything, especially in insurance. And so having that point of contact is really important, I would say. So definitely reach out to your agent. I'm a talker naturally, though, so I won't take up our full time. I'm going to turn it over to Josh Abbott. He does a great job with claims and he has a lot more insight than I would have. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. And uh, thank you for allowing us to join today. Um, first of all, I'll say, Casey, you did a fantastic job uh, outlining insurance as a whole. Uh, the convective storms that have affected us over the past uh, three years now have uh, truly been a challenge. Uh, Nathan, you referenced the event of March 3rd of last year. Uh, for Kentucky Farm Bureau alone, uh, that was 44,000 claims and over $400 million in damage. So um, I appreciate uh, the perspective that you bring with that um, experience that you had. Um, and having said that, I think my my part of this call, um, Nathan covered a lot of it very well, but how to efficiently file a claim. And I think the one thing that you've got to consider when you're ready to file a claim is uh, being prepared to tell your story. Uh, we consider that first call the first notice of loss uh, in insurance terms, FNOL. Um, but at that time, that's when you want to uh, have all your facts together, parties involved. Um, let us know all that information up front. Um, you know, some things that came to mind for me. Uh, so what happened and when did it happen? Uh, you know, uh, the the when and where uh, and and how are very important uh, for us as insurance adjusters. As much detail as you can provide on the front end uh, will certainly expedite the handling of that claim because we'll be able to get that to the proper adjuster to handle that. If it's a liability incident, uh, Casey, you brought that up uh, in your presentation. Were there witnesses? Who were those parties involved? names and numbers. Um, as soon as we can contact those people uh, to get their side of the story, uh, that is truly, and, and what they saw, that that's very helpful for us. Um, also tell you, um, you know, with, with reporting a claim, be timely with it. Um, if you notice something, so whether it be uh, related to a structure or related to even inventory that you have uh, within that structure, uh, be timely with it. If you acknowledge that something is wrong, uh, call your agent and get some advice from them is what I would do, uh, whether or not to proceed with that claim, because they'll give you good advice on that. Uh, for crop insurance, as I understand it, we don't handle crop insurance at Kentucky Farm Bureau. Many of our agents may help you uh, do that, but there are some uh, reporting requirements as far as time involved with that. I think you've got 72 hours, more or less, uh, by way of a lot of policies to report the claim. And there might be 15 day requirements around harvesting. So just make sure that you know the requirements. Nathan talked about the policy, uh, know the policy and the requirements associated with that. Um, 
let's see. Accurate loss location is super important. Um, you know, a lot of farms will be spread out um, amongst uh, several acres, hundreds of acres even, or multiple locations. And so if you do call in a claim, uh, regardless of what it's to, let us know where that loss is located at. If you have your policy deck page uh, and you can outline the description around that structure or even uh, the farm that it's on, outline that for us when you call that in. And again, that will just help us expedite uh, getting that claim to the right person uh, in that area with that knowledge or skill set to be able to evaluate that. Um, if you've got damaged equipment, and you can find an associated serial number. Uh, those serial numbers are associated with uh, those items listed on your deck page a lot of times. And again, that's just going to streamline the process for us. Um, the other thing that I'll tell you, Nathan, you kind of mentioned this, preserve any evidence. So I'll tell you, mitigate your damages. Uh, so in the, in the case that we have a windstorm, you want to, uh, as soon as possible, take any photos of the damage. Uh, but as soon as you can mitigate the damage to whatever the contents are, um, you know, uh, within that structure, uh, mitigate those damages, get that covered uh, with those with those pictures that that should document the loss uh, well enough uh, for us to go ahead and handle that. Again, um, looking back to uh, March 3rd of last year, uh, we did have a lot of people out handling claims. And um, when you're put in that position, you're you're, you're trying to help uh, your members get back in a better spot as soon as possible. So any photos, um, anything like that, if you've got estimates even before the adjuster gets out there, that's great to have. Knowing the value of, um, you know, your property, or your structure, that's super important as well. Um, then I'll just tell you as it relates to any inventory that you may have. So again, we don't have, uh, we don't cover the crop itself, but after it's harvested and you know if it may be considered inventory as part of a business any receipts that you have that can support financially the loss associated with that event um, that will help your adjuster a whole lot as well so um, those are just some uh, tips that I have from a reporting uh, standpoint um, again Nathan you, you did most of my job for me and I appreciate that and I appreciate you sharing your experience so um, Danny I don't know I'll turn it back over to you or Spencer